I'm going to be talking about uh, mostly about this little beast, um, a project that actually started, predates the NEST TSR hub, started in 2011, um, but which the, the NEST Threatened Species Hub is now um, contributing to, uh, to us to really dissect and understand what happened with this, um, this project or this case study um, using genomic tools, uh, as well as extending the approach to another species. And uh, I'll just say, uh, the hand model's actually in the audience, Casey. <laughs> So it is. <laughs> so a question that I'm often asked is why do we even really care about genetic variation? Why not just take care of itself? Um, and the, the reason why we care about uh, genetic variation is because um, it's very important from an evolutionary point of view. It's very important for species to be able to adapt, particularly in changing uh, environments. We know that many and perhaps most populations of widespread species are locally adapted. And what this means is that they're genetically different um, to deal with those local conditions. We also know, which um, really has only come about over the last few decades, is that adaptation can happen very, very quickly in the space of a few short generations. And one of the key and critical oops, components to this is the introduction of new genes into populations. It's a key component of adaptation or fitness. So evolutionary rates depend um, largely on a couple of things. One is population size. The bigger the population size, the faster evolution can happen. And that's primarily because, it doesn't necessarily mean it will happen, but it can happen. And that's primarily because of the driver of mutation. The bigger you are, the more chance that beneficial mutations will enter that population. Another thing that is critical is the movement of genes between, or gene variants between populations. And um, that's the connectedness of populations, which actually comes back to creating a larger population size, total population size of a species. We also know from an evolutionary point of view that you can get movement of genes between species. Now, I won't touch on this now, but that's certainly found uh, throughout our evolutionary history. So the thing that is critical is connectivity. We need to maintain connectivity, connectivity of populations if we're to promote adaptation and evolution. Unfortunately, when we talk about threatened species, we're often talking about small, heavily fragmented populations. And so we're losing a lot of these processes. And what happens when you lose those processes this is a, uh, a plot of um, essentially a population genetic analysis of a freshwater fish, um, the southern pygmy perch. Um, essentially, you don't really need to know much about this, except for we have different populations here along this axis. And when you're a different colour, it means that you're genetically different. So there's not much gene flow occurring between different colours. Within a colour, they're essentially the one population. So this is typically what we see when we do a genetic analysis of um, threatened species. We see a lot of unique populations. We place a lot of significance on these unique populations. Often we call them subspecies. We call them evolutionary uh, significant units, management units, a whole bunch of different names throughout the literature. Now, we stumbled across this in freshwater fish, um, which is not actually unexpected by theory. And that is that there's a direct relationship between your uniqueness and the genetic diversity that you have within a population. And so populations that are quite divergent, quite unique, actually lack genetic diversity. And this is what we found in southern pygmy perch and a few other freshwater species. So what this is telling us is that random genetic drift is driving genetic divergence, not local adaptation. So in small populations like threatened species, this is a very paramount um, process. We, we were interested to see whether this is a bit more widespread than just in freshwater fish, which are going to be very susceptible to random genetic drift because as you get uh, drought and floods, you get a population or an individual that might get into a waterway, it explodes, creates a, a whole new population of individuals from essentially one or two individuals. So you expect genetic drift to operate there. What we didn't realise is that it also operates quite um, 
um, universally in marsupials, threatened species. So these are four different uh, marsupials, the mountain pygmy possum, the eastern quoll, um, the eastern bar bandicoot and the northern quoll. And what we find is a similar type relationship, albeit driven often by one or two uh, unique populations. So we started thinking, right, well, what does that actually mean from a population fitness perspective? It means that, well, if we're going to save some of these populations, we need to increase their genetic diversity. And this may actually have positive fitness benefits. And so the species that we, we undertook such a strategy, um, and we call this genetic strategy, um, well, there's, there's various names in the literature and the definitions of them are genetic rescue, uh, which is essentially restoring the fitness of a population through the removal of slightly deleterious alleles. This is a short-term effect and you expect a, a dramatic effect in fitness if genetic rescue actually occurs. Genetic restoration is more about the long term. It's more about introducing variation into that population so it has the ability to adapt and change through time. And the, the new area that we were working in is gene pool widening. It's essentially a mix of the two, but where we're crossing more divergent genomes. Genomes that have actually been isolated for long periods of time. We're arguing that it's drift that has caused that divergence um, and not local adaptation. And so we undertook uh, a project on the mountain pygmy possum. Uh, it's found in essentially three geographical regions which corresponds with our alpine zones uh, throughout southeastern Australia. You have Mount Buller, uh, the Bogon High Plains, Mount Higginbotham, Mount Bogon, and then you have Kosciuszko National Park. It's an endangered species under the EPBC Act. Um, and it's been known to exist in the central region um, since 19, 1966, uh, but was only discovered in the southern region in 1996, at, right within the Mount Buller Resort. We had a student that, that worked on this a number of years ago and looked at the genetic diversity. And this is just a plot of the genetic diversity um, from the different regions. You've got the northern region, you've got the central region, and you've got the, the Mount Buller southern region. And what we noticed with the southern region was that it lacked a lot of genetic diversity. It had about a third the genetic diversity that we found in the other populations. This population had actually been monitored since it was discovered in 1996, uh, yearly, during the, uh, the spring monitoring period. And what we found was a, uh, a, a very stark demographic collapse within the population. Um, essentially, it, uh, by 2010, there was only about 20 individuals left within that Mount Buller population. When we looked at it from a genetic point of view, we also found a very stark and contrasting pattern, or sorry, similar pattern um, to what we found with the demographic decline. Genetic diversity, um, using these two different measures of genetic diversity, heterozygosity and allelic diversity, had also crashed through time. This was, uh, this was certainly concerning. What led to this decline was largely habitat fragmentation that had gone on at Mount Buller through the development of the, the Mount Buller Resort. Um, this is a photo in 1970, an aerial photo, and as you see, um, there was a whole raft of additions made, ski runs, ski lifts, uh, clearing that went on in that sort of 20 to 30 year period. The main area of uh, mountain pygmy possums is this area known as the Federation uh, area. And as you can see, there was a lot that went on from a habitat perspective in this area. This was a, a, obviously a, a, one of the reasons why it declined in the first place. What, we, um, what, what happened in 2005 was that there was a recovery uh, plan implemented by the resort. Um, in essence, they recreated habitat, they linked up fragmented boulder fields, boulder fields are the primary habitat of mountain pygmy possums, and um, they went about uh, a predator control program where they controlled both foxes and cats. So the ingredients were in place from 2005, but we didn't see any response from the, uh, the population. It essentially was still declining and the genetic diversity was still declining. So we um, developed a strategy where we would actually move individuals from Mount Hotham, the central region, that had healthy, genetically healthy populations across to Mount Buller. 
So in 2011, we translocated six males from Mount Hotham. Uh, what we found in the juvenile trapping period in 2012, the, the summer of 2012, 50% of the juveniles uh, resulted from these six males. What we also found in 2012 was the F1 hybrids were more fit and they were bigger. More fit, they had more pouch young than their uh, Mount Buller uh, female full bloods. Um, we also found in 2012 and 13 that the fitness difference between them uh, was 2 and 1.8 respectively. So hybrid was good. We also found in the F2 population for the first time every single female in that population had four pouch young. Right now in 2015, uh, we're actually about to undertake monitoring again at the end of this month, 87% of the population now have some genes from Mount Hotham. This is just an example of the size difference that you get. This is from 2013 uh, between hybrids in green um, and the bull of full bloods in blue. Um, males uh, are one, uh, sorry, uh, females are one and uh, males are two and you see a large difference in size between them. This is um, pouch young has increased steadily through the years. Big leap in 2012 and 13. Um, and also we've seen the expected response in genetic variation through time. And this is what's happened to the population size. As of 2000, spring 2015, uh, obviously gone through the decline, there was a little bit of a recovery, uh, very good uh, year um, in those two years preceding uh, when the translocation happened. And then from 2012, where we expect the genetic rescue to kick in, that's the F1 females, we've seen a 50% increase in population size each year. Quite dramatic. So what's going on there now? So this is the area that I'm primarily talking about, the Federation Bowl, uh, Wombat and Women's Run. So there's a lot of habitat works, as you can see from this figure, that have gone on. Um, we have a lot of possums now in these areas. In fact, there's more possums than they were first discovered in 1996. There's no possums over here, which back in 1996 there were, and there's no possums uh, on the North Summit. So the plan is to start looking at translocations to these habitats to increase and enhance population size on the mountain. We're also now implementing this exact same strategy in eastern Bar Bandicoots. Uh, similar scenario, we have healthy genetically um, populations in Tasmania. We have um, populations found in conservation parks and zoos in Victoria, three areas, although there's another, another uh, region um, on Churchill Island that was just reintroduced last year. Uh, they've all stemmed from 19 individuals. There's been a lot of variation loss. And what we're going to do is introduce some Tasmanian uh, genes into the Victorian and look at how population, uh, population fitness changes through time. So where can we actually apply this approach? We think it has broad applicability. Um, in, the, in a study, previous study that was published this year, we actually showed that where we had genetic data, 86% of mammals had that drift relationship where you had lost genetic diversity. Um, some high profile examples, lead beaters, possum, koala, Tassie devil. It's more than likely that gene pool widening can be uh, applied in these cases. Certainly in fish, in freshwater fish, uh, likely in a whole raft of other species. And again, certainly in plants, and people that uh, know the plant world know that actually there are a few steps in advance of what we've been doing here. Uh, there's already a very great push to introduce composite provenancing, uh, which is the sourcing of seed from a variety of different populations uh, to provide, um, I guess, genetic variation into that population going forward, rather than just sourcing seed locally. One thing that I must stress though, it's not going to solve everything. You need a good working recovery model. If we hadn't had reconnected the habitats at Mount Buller um, and introduced the predator control program, none of this would have been possible. Similar with eastern barred bandicoots, we know that foxes are the problem. So we've got to put them back into places where there aren't foxes, which is either conservation fenced areas 
or on islands. So you do need that working recovery model. You really need a healthy population. It's no good uh, crossing two genetically uh, depauperate populations because you might actually end up with a worse problem. And ideally, and I won't go into the reasons, but you would do this in either wild or the conservation parks. And I'll uh, leave it there. Thanks, Andrew. It's fascinating stuff. Have we got, some, uh, got a couple of minutes for questions? Sarah. Yeah, Andrew, the council locations are managed rather differently among the jurisdictions, but you know, in general there's um, quite a strong, usually a strong effort to keep uh, subspecies separated, not to mix them during translocations. Um, so, obviously, some of your work has got bearing on decisions like that. So, so, how do you reconcile that management approach, I guess, with the implications from the work you just described here? Yeah, look, and it's not a simple, a simple thing to disentangle that, the subspecies level. Um, I think certainly for, for a number of subspecies that are um, that have gone through this process where drift is really driving um, loss of diversity and um, you know, that population uniqueness. This sort of a strategy we need to look at. Um, where it's going to be more difficult is where you've got a long uh, time span which separates those populations. An example might be in, uh, in birds, uh, eastern and western ground parrots, for instance, where it's millions of years. That's where you might expect something like uh, outbreeding depression to start coming into it. So it's not always going to be a simple story, um, but I think that we need to understand you know, the level of divergence that we find between these populations rather than just classifying them unique and labelling them as subspecies because they occur in different areas. Well, look, in the cases that I'm describing, we've been, for both mountain pygmy possum and the eastern barb bandicoot, we've been pretty lucky in that, um, you know, we've had samples from when they were first, essentially, for the mountain pygmy possum discovered at Mount Buller, and for the eastern barb bandicoot when those individuals were brought in um, into uh, the captive environment back in the early or late uh, 1980s. Um, for other specimens, it's probably population comparison or comparison with uh, museum specimens where you get the chance. Yeah, and that, that was great. Is, is there potential through the hub to come up with a little bit of a checklist of the kinds of things that you might work through to, to sort of guide managers about where they might do this, where it wouldn't be a good thing to do, along the lines of what Sarah was just... Yeah, yeah look, we had a, um, a genetics workshop earlier in the year, which really was delving into a lot of these questions, how you source individuals, uh, when you might mix populations, um, you know, and, and how you might approach it. And I think that there are some certain ground rules that you can easily come up with. Um, there's other ground rules that you really need some information about before you actually proceed down that case. Um, what I'm really interested in is, is delving into that subspecies issue because it's going to become a lot more prominent you know, throughout uh, you know, our conservation-based efforts over the next probably 10, 15 years. So maybe that might be something that the hub might aim to do is to create that checklist or protocol to think through some of these things. Yeah. Yep. Okay, thanks very much, Andrew. Right. That's great.